All right, guys, I'm Chitif Hadangs, and this is my first episode requested by one of my supporters on Patreon. And you can make requests too if you make a pledge. Uh, today, we're going to be learning how to properly design oval apertures for anamorphaking lenses while also reducing light loss to a minimum and figuring out the new f stop of the lens. This is definitely not one of those situations where one size fits all. Each lens should have its own design anamorphic disc for optimizing light, basically. Uh, the tools we're going to need are a caliper, any lens you want to anamorphic and you know how to reach the aperture mechanism, and a vector-based program. On my case, I'll be using Adobe Illustrator. The first part is to get to the aperture mechanism of the lens you want to mod. I recently did the Tire 11 Apple, so I'll use that one. When you get to the aperture, there's two numbers you want to get. The first one is the diameter of the mechanism area. In this case, it's 51.9 millimeters. The second number is the diameter of the aperture, the hole that lets light through, which is 44.86 millimeters. Write things down with two decimal cases, as precision is always good when dealing with small builds. With these two numbers, I'll go on Illustrator and create two concentric circles. Don't forget the measurement unit to make it in scale with real life. The bigger circle on the outside is going to be the full size of the disc, while the small circle is going to be the cut to let light through. So far so good. The problem is there's nothing anamorphic about this. Select the inner circle and change its width without messing with the height. The percentage of the original size you want to use depends on the stretch factor you want to fake. Just divide your one by your stretch factor and that'll give you 75% for 1.33, 67% for 1.5, and 50% for 2 times stretch. This design will give you a disc that will fit over the aperture mechanism so it can't fall anywhere and at the same time benefits from all the vertical height of the aperture, which minimizes your light loss to about as little as you can get. If this much math already sounds crazy to you, you better stop watching this video now because we're going way deeper. First, we're going to calculate how the oval affects your maximum aperture, your maximum f-stop. And if you don't know how the f-stop math works, here's a crash course. For every square root of 2 change in the circle area, you cut one f-stop. Like if you make it square root of 2 times smaller, you cut one f-stop. If you make it square root of two times bigger, you add one f-stop. There is probably a better way, an easier way to see this, to understand this, but you should go look for it. For now, I'm gonna stay with this, and in terms of visually representing this, square root of two equals 1.41, and when we divide one, which is our maximum aperture, the total area of the circle by 1.41, we get 0.7. This means that every time you shrink the total area of the circle to 70% of its original size, you're cutting down one stop of light. And that's pretty much what we did, right? Let's do the math for the tire. We originally had an aperture with 40.46 millimeters diameter, which equals f2.8 on this lens. The area for it is the formula for area is pi times radius height times radius width. Duh, it's a circle. Both radiuses are the same. Bear with me. This equals pi, 3.14, times radius, which is half of the 44.46 diameter, so 22.23 times 22.23. Yes, I wrote that wrong, but the math is right. This equals 1551.7 square millimeters. This means that a f2.8 aperture for this lens has an area of 1551.7 square millimeters. And following our logic, f4 will be 70% of the area, which is 1086.19 square millimeters. Now I'm going to cut it down to a 1.5 times oval by reducing its width to 67% of the original size. Ovals are also called ellipses. And there's a formula for their area too. It's pi times radius height times radius width. See my point now? So 3.14 times 22.23, this time I got it right, times 66% of 22.23. 
The second part is equal to 14.67 and the first section is 69.8. Multiply these two and we get to 1024 square millimeters. 67% is close enough to 70% which is square root of 2 which means one stop of light loss. So by making this a 1.5 times anamorphic, we're cutting down one f-stop from the maximum aperture of our original now modified lens. f2.8 becomes f4. If you make it two times bokeh, then you're cutting the area in half, which is square root of two times square root of two. So two stops of light. This will unfold into resolution and depth of field. Since your vertical aperture is considerably wider than your horizontal aperture, you'll end up with better image resolution and sharpness horizontally, since it's a narrower f-stop than vertically. Which is funny because with regular anamorphics, it's the other way around. When using an anamorphic lens, you get better vertical resolution since you're effectively squeezing more information into the horizontal axis. This is all fairly confusing, but it also leads to the last point of this episode. Many of you guys like to use anamorphic lenses to enhance bokeh in, in adapters in which bokeh is less pronounced, such as 1.5 or 1.33 stretch. So for the rest of this episode, let's assume that we live in a world where the dream most desired bokeh is two times. And the reason I say that is because combining anamorphics and anamorphics, you can easily achieve unrealistic bokeh, like three times or four times. But that's not what I'm trying to do here. So just stick along, follow along, and you'll be able to figure out these unrealistic bokehs for yourself if you want to do so. For now, I'll write the path for optimizing light loss and achieving two times bokeh through the combination of 1.33 and 1.5 anamorphics and a custom designed aperture. The best way to approach this problem is to start at the end. The result we want to achieve is 0.5 or 50% width. And that number has to be the product of two other numbers, stretch factor and anamorphic aperture. And you have to know at least one of them. In order to bring in the stretch factor, divided by 1. If I'm using a 1.5 stretch bolex, I'll divide it 1 by 1.5, which equals 0 0.67. Now we solve the equation for what's left. 0 0.5 equals 0 0.67 times x, and x equals to 0 0.74. When we're aiming for a 1.33 anamorphic, the oval squeeze is 0 0.75. These are pretty close which means they are interchangeable. If you're aiming for a two times squeeze while using a 1.5 anamorphic, you'll need a 1.33 anamorphic. And if you're using a 1.33 anamorphic, you will need a 1.5 fake. In the end, 0.67 and 0.75 are close enough to 0.7, which is 70% and represents the loss of one stop of light. So if you're losing one stop of light to fake two times bokeh, that is not too expensive, is it? Another positive aspect of combining anamorphics and anamorphics is that remember that anamorphics have lesser horizontal resolution because you're compressing image onto those pixels and anamorphics have better horizontal resolution because you're using a smaller aperture for the horizontal aspect ratio. Well, this makes for a best of both worlds type of scenario, which is definitely not common when shooting scope. And wow, this started out simple enough, but ended on a very elaborate note. Whew! Now, if you managed to make sense out of all of this, please like this video and leave a comment below saying, ah, I get it, all in caps. And if you got this far and you're not a subscriber yet, you should really hit subscribe because we have a lot in common and you're gonna love what's coming. Plus, if you wanna suggest me a, a topic for an episode just like Andre did this one, sign up on my Patreon page and tell me what you want and we'll get far on this anamorphic business. I'm Chit Fahadangs and I'll see you next week.